Welcome everyone. Uh, this is a ongoing series of air quality data products using a new generation of satellite called geostationary satellites. So we are here in the week two or session two of this series. In session one, we have learned about uh, some of the available geostationary satellite sensors, some basics about uh, uh, differences between uh, low Earth orbit orbiting satellites, which have been providing air quality observation for almost 20 plus years, such as MODIS, OMI, uh, VIRS, uh, etc. So we are entering into this new era where we can actually focus on a specific region and get very high temporal resolution data uh, to support air quality application. So in week one, again, we learned about level 1B or true color imageries, uh, how to access through the world view and other online based tools. Today uh, in week two or part two, we have we are going to talk about air quality product from the Gozar of series. And for that, we have our guest speaker, Dr. Amy K. Howe uh, from NOAA uh, NASDAQ, and she is going to introduce the air quality products from the Gozar series of satellites. Thank you again for joining week two. And then in week three, we will have finally conclude this series where, where we will talk about the GEMS air quality data, which focused in uh, Asia. So let's begin for the, today's uh, with Dr. Amy Hump. Thank you, everyone. Hello, everyone. My name is Amy Huff. Um, I'm a senior research scientist at IMSG, and I'm a member of the Aerosols and Atmospheric Composition Science team at the NOAA NESDIS Center for Satellite Applications and Research. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you um, about air quality products, specifically aerosol optical depth from the GOES-R satellites. So I, I'd like to acknowledge the aerosol product leads uh, at NOAA. So that's Dr. Shoba Kondragunta and Dr. Isfan Laszlo. Um, and then my colleagues at STAR who developed the AOD products, aerosol optical depth products that I'm going to discuss today, um, Dr. Mi Zhao, Dr. Hongqing Liu, and Dr. Ha Zhang. All right, so um, this is just, I wanted to cover the, um, go over the topics that I'm going to discuss today. So first I'm going to give a brief overview of the aerosol optical depth product from the GOES-R satellites. Then we're going to break, and I'm going to actually show you NOAA's Aerosol Watch website, um, because that has prepared imagery of the products that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, then we're going to come back, and I'm just going to have a few more slides. I just want to discuss some details about the GOES-R data files that we're going to work with in the hands-on exercise, um, just to give you a little background and information that you'll need to work with those data on your own. Um, then we're going to lead into uh, most of the presentation today will be the Python hands-on exercises. And so specifically, we'll show you how to, with Python, download um, level two derived data files from NOAA's aerosol, um, excuse me, NOAA's uh, uh, Amazon Web Services archive. Um, then we're going to open up one of those files that we downloaded so you can understand the metadata and what the data variables are. Then we're going to actually process and visualize aerosol optical depth data on a map. And then finally, we're going to create an animation. We're actually going to visualize. We're going to make one hour's worth, so six images of AOD data. And then we're going to create a little animation or movie from those image files. All right, so as I mentioned, first, I'd just like to give a, a short overview of the aerosol optical depth product from NOAA's goes our satellites um, and the, the sensor that is on the GOES-R satellites is called the Advanced Baseline Imager, or the ABI. Um, so, so Dr. Gupta last week uh, talked a little bit about aerosol optical depth. Um, you may remember it's a remote sensing measurement. It can be made from satellites, from the surface, or from aircraft. Uh, so AOD is a quantitative measure of aerosols in a vertical column of the atmosphere. So it's a measure of scattering and absorption of light by aerosols. So the, um, the GOES-R ABI AOD is reported for a 550 nanometer light. So AOD is unitless. Typically values uh, will vary from zero to one in the United States, but values can be as high as five. 
So larger values uh, correspond to high concentrations of aerosols like smoke and dust, and lower values are for a clean or clear atmosphere. So in the images below, you can see on the left, um, this is a GOES-16 or GOES-East ABI geocolor uh, or visible image from September 16th of this year. Um, and so hopefully you can see there's uh, kind of these gray shading areas here in the Western US um, and also here in the Eastern US, this is smoke from wildfires. And if you look at the corresponding aerosol optical depth image, um, you can see the, the color bars here. So again, these blue colors that corresponds to clean atmospheres. And when you get to the yellow, the orange and the red, um, that is indicating high aerosol optical depth from the smoke. So again, you can see where the wildfires are actually burning in the Western US. You can see those red, uh, orange and yellow colors. And then also with the transport smoke in the Eastern US, um, it's not quite as optically thick as, as where the, the smoke is being emitted from the fires because it's been transported across the US, but you can still clearly see um, the yellow, orange, and some of these teal colors corresponding to the smoke. All right, so why is AOD useful for air quality? Um, so unlike the, the true color or the visible or the geocolor imagery, that only provides qualitative info. Um, so as I mentioned, aerosol optical depth is quantitative. And so that means that AOD is proportional to the number or the mass concentration of aerosols in the atmosphere. And because of that, we can estimate surface PM2.5 concentrations from aerosol optical depth. And our group has developed a new algorithm that dynamically updates these uh, satellite aerosol optical depth and surface PM2.5 relationships using what's called a geographically weighted regression or GWR model. Um, and you can see um, some of the references um, below from the recent publications by our group. Um, and so the way this works is you can see this is an example. Um, this is the same example from the previous page on September 16th of this year. And you can see the high aerosol optical depth from the smoke in the Western US and the Eastern US. Um, and so based on that information, we can, um, using the, the relationships that have been developed by our group, estimate surface PM2.5. Um, and that's shown here using the, the PM2.5 air quality index. So again, any place where you see these orange, red, purple, or maroon colors, um, that indicates um, high estimated surface PM2.5 um, that's derived from the hourly um, ABI AOD data. Um, and so the, the real benefit with this is that it helps fill in gaps in the surface regulatory monitor network. Um, and these new hourly PM2.5 maps, like what you see here, um, they're going to be used by the AirNow program. So they'll be available publicly um, very soon, sometime within the next year. All right. So um, as I mentioned, AOD, it's available from the Advanced Baseline Imager, or ABI, on uh, the GOES satellite. So that includes GOES East, which is currently GOES 16, and GOES West, which is currently GOES 17. Um, but GOES-18 will be replacing GOES-17 as GOES-West in early January of next year. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the data range um, is actually, it goes up to five, um, and it's, it goes down to minus 0.05. Um, and so you can think of these very small negative values. What they do is they indicate uncertainty in the AOD retrieval. Just think of them as very small positive AODs. All right. Um, and so this, uh, this graphic over here kind of gives you an idea of, uh, in terms of the, the number value of aerosol optical depth, what that corresponds to in terms of thickness of aerosols in the atmosphere. Um, and so you can see the specifications and the availability in the table here at the bottom. The thing to remember is the spatial resolution is two kilometers for aerosol optical depth from both goes east and goes west. Um, and then you may remember last week, Dr. Gupta was talking about the, the coverage, the scan sectors for the, the GOES-R satellites. Um, so there's three. There's full disk, which is the full hemispheric disk, the CONUS, which is just focusing on um, essentially the continental United States, and then there's two adjustable mesoscale sectors. So aerosol optical depth is not retrieved for the, meros the mesoscale sectors, so just be aware of that. It's only available for the full disk and the CONUS sector. All right, um, so aerosol optical depth, as I mentioned, it's a, the, derived from the extinction of backscattered light by aerosols. The ABI aerosol optical depth is reported at 550 nanometers. Um, and so the retrieval, so basically how we determine aerosol optical depth, it's determined using an algorithm, which is like a formula that we use to calculate or we'll say retrieve aerosol optical depth. You might hear that term retrieved. 
Um, so just as a reminder, aerosol optical depth is what's called a level two or L2 product. Um, and that uses the ABI radiances, which are also called the level 1B data as inputs. Um, and so I'll explain this example in the table here in a minute. Um, so the, the thing to remember when you're, you're thinking about the, the AOD algorithm is that the challenge in constructing the algorithm is retrieving aerosol optical depth. Um, you need to isolate the extinction of the backscattered light by aerosols from all the other things that are scattering light in the atmosphere. So specifically, we need to separate the aerosol signal from the surface reflectance and then scattering by clouds and absorb absorption by trace gases in the atmosphere. Um, and the way the ABI AOD algorithm does that is what's called a multi-band algorithm. So it builds on the heritage for the polar orbiting satellite algorithms, such as VIRS and MODIS aerosol optical depth. And there are separate algorithms for aerosol optical depth retrieved over land and over water. Um, and a key feature is using ABI band six to estimate the surface reflectance over land. And there's also various internal tests um, that use different bands to screen for unfavorable conditions. And that's where it's difficult or impossible to retrieve AOD, like where there's clouds, for example. Um, so in this table, this is just showing the bands, the seven bands that are used in the AOD algorithm. Um, and you can see the corresponding wavelengths there. And as I mentioned, some of them are used in the actual AOD retrieval itself, and some of them are used for these internal tests. All right, so um, I'd like to illustrate how the Gozar ABI multi-channel AOD algorithm um, works. Uh, so as you remember, I mentioned that there's separate AOD algorithms over land and over water, um, and each of them include a number of different aerosol models. Um, and the aerosol models are actually what's retrieving AOD. So I just wanted to show a simplified uh, version of that using the figure here. So in the figure, we're using um, an example of two different aerosol models. Um, and that's represented, aerosol num model number one is represented by this black line here. Uh, and then aerosol model number two is represented by this red line here. Um, and these lines represent the aerosol optical depth retrieved at 550 nanometers using inputs as ABI band one on the x-axis and then band two on the y-axis. So let's imagine that we have an observation which is represented by this orange dot here. Um, and so if we look at the reflectance in band one, we get two different AOD values. So using aerosol model one, we would have an AOD value of 1.6. Um, and if we used AOD model two, we would have an AOD value of 1.0. So which one is correct? So let's look at the reflectance in band two. So if we do that now, we can see that um, the difference, or what we call the residual, the difference between the AOD retrieved with model one is larger than that with AOD model number two. So basically this distance between the reflectance in band two between AOD model two and the observation is smaller than that between the observation and AOD model one. Um, and so that means that we're going to use model two as our retrieved AOD, and the, the, the actual AOD value will be 1.0. Um, so in terms of validation, so how do we know the, the accuracy and the, the precision of the, the GOES ABI AOD data? Um, so they're validated using uh, Aeronet aerosol optical depth data. So um, Dr. Gupta mentioned um, Aeronet last, in last week's training. So Aeronet is a global network of ground-based sun photometers, um, and those AOD data are used to verify satellite aerosol optical depth. And so for this particular validation, we're looking at the most recent version of the high-quality GO-16 ABI AOD, um, and this is for the time period from October 24, 2020 to September 23, 2022. So again, we can see we have separate results for over land and over water, as you remember, um, from a couple slides ago, there's separate AOD algorithms to retrieve AOD over land and over water. Um, and so in figure A here at the top, um, you can see essentially what this is showing is the uh, relationship between ABI AOD and Aeronet AOD. Um, and so you can see for both land and over water, there's a very small bias, um, a positive bias of about 0.01. Um, and then the standard deviation of the, uh, the correspondence between the ABI AOD and the Aeronet AOD over land 
is about twice as large as that over water. Um, and that has to do, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to the fact that there's more uncertainty in estimating the surface reflectance over lands than over water. Um, and then in the lower figures, figure B, or B here, um, you can see that the ABI AOD captures the diurnal variability observed by Aeronet AOD. So here we're looking at um, the uh, Aeronet AOD in blue, the blue line, and the ABI AOD is the red line. Um, and this is for um, the local time, average time during the day. Um, and then you can also see on the, um, the Y2 axis, these gray bars of the number of matchups, meaning the number of coincident measured um, AOD from Aeronet and from the ABI satellite. And so again, you can see um, for both over land and then over water, these two lines, the red and blue lines, are, are very close together. All right, so um, in the last slide, we referenced the high quality AOD data. One thing to be aware of with AOD data um, from the advanced baseline imager um, is that they come with what are called data quality flags. Um, and these express the confidence in AOD data. So in the figure here, you can see example of the, the data quality flags for GO16 ABI AOD. Um, so high quality is the most accurate, um, and it's used for all quantitative applications, like the verification that if people were using it from a modeling application. There's also medium quality, so that has some uncertainty. So it can be safely used for qualitative applications uh, like forecasting or any sort of operational applications. Um, and then the low quality, that has high uncertainty. And so we recommend avoiding that for most, most situations. Um, and then AOD is not retrieved for areas um, with clouds or bright surfaces like snow or ice um, or bright land surfaces, kind of like deserts and mountainous regions. And also sun glint, which uh, Dr. Powell, uh, or Dr. Gupta, excuse me, mentioned last week. And then of course at nighttime as well, we need visible light to have um, AOD retreats. All right, so I just wanna show some examples of what I mean by these high, medium, and low quality uh, ABI AODs. So this is an example um, from, a, from wildfires that were burning near Los Angeles in December, 2020. Um, so the first example here, this is high quality AOD only. Um, and so you can see there's quite a few um, uh, missing areas, these kind of holes in this plume of high AOD corresponding to smoke from these wildfires that were burning near Los Angeles. Um, and there's also a lot of missing AOD along coastlines. So next, if we look at now high and medium, so I'll go back. So this is just high, and this is high plus medium. We can see that most of the smoke port and the higher AOD from that smoke has been filled in. And um, there's still some gaps along the coastlines, but they're not quite as big as they were with the high quality data only. And then finally, now, if we look at high plus medium plus low, so again, I'll go back. This is high plus medium, and this is high plus medium plus low. You can see now that, in fact, all of the plume has been filled in. Um, and most of the, the gaps along the coastlines also, but the problem is now you can see, hopefully there's a lot of these red, little red patches along the coastlines, and then some inland. So these are erroneous high AOD retrievals. So they're, they're wrong, essentially, they're false positive. So that's the limitation of using the low quality is that you can fill in, for example, something like a smoke plume, um, but it comes with a cost of these uh, uh, erroneous high AOD values. So the bottom line is you just need to make sure if you're working with ABI AOD data that you know um, what the quality flags are and that you use the appropriate quality flags. Uh, we recommend avoiding the low quality for most situations. Um, and then for kind of routine operational applications, um, we recommend using high plus medium. We call that the top two qualities AOD data. And when we work with the Python um, in, in a bit, you'll, you'll get to actually see the, the different quality flags and, and get a feel for them. Okay, so one other thing I want to mention is that um, AOD is often um, missing, it's not retrieved in very thick aerosol plumes. So you can see in the example here, um, so this, this is AOD and uh, true color imagery from the Polar Orbiting Satellite, um, SNPP, and the VIRS instrument, but the ABI AOD is very similar. So in this case, on um, September 8th, 2020, we had really thick smoke from wildfires um, in Oregon and Washington and California. So you can see the thick smoke here. 
Um, and then the AOD algorithm, um, it just, it, what it does is it misclassifies this very thick smoke as a cloud. Um, and so there's no AOD retrieved in cloudy areas. And so that's why we'll have the missing AOD corresponding to that very thick smoke. So this is a very common um, situation with all AOD algorithms. Um, it's an area of active research. Um, so as a user, it's just something to be aware of. All right, so just to summarize, um, the reason why um, we use aerosol optical depth, um, and we also use it for air quality, is because it's a quantitative measure of aerosols, and it can be used to estimate surface PM2.5 concentrations. It's really easy to interpret and identify areas of high aerosol concentrations, typically from smoke, um, blowing dust, or from haze, and it supplements visible imagery. Um, but the limitations are, um, we didn't talk that much about this, but it's a column measurement. So again, we're, it's looking at the aerosols in a vertical column of the atmosphere. So just looking at aerosol optical depth, you don't really know where those aerosols are. They may not be reaching the surface. Uh, and also there's no aerosol optical depth retrieved in areas where there's clouds or reflective or bright surfaces. So snow, ice, areas of sun glint or bright surfaces, and it's available during the daytime only. All right, so what I'd like to do next is I'd like to do a demonstration of NOAA's Aerosol Watch website. And so this is where you can find both near real time and archived imagery from the GOZAR satellites. Uh, so I believe we're putting the URL for Aerosol Watch in the chat. Um, but if it's sometime later and you're looking at this after the training, um, what you want to do is just, you know, pull up your favorite web browser. We recommend Google Chrome. Um, and you want to type into your search engine NOAA Aerosol Watch. And it should be the first uh, result. So let's click on that. And so, yeah, so this is the NOAA Aerosol Watch website. Um, and so as it, what it will do is it will load the um, most recent approximately one hour of GOES-16 or GOES-East geocolor imagery. And so uh, I believe Dr. Gupta talked about geocolor last week. So geocolor is the uh, simulated true color imagery from the, uh, the ABI sensor on the GOES-R satellites. Because the ABI doesn't have a green band, the green band is simulated. All right, so one thing I like to do first is I like to come over here. So on the right-hand side, um, these, these kind of white um, uh, uh, menus here will allow you to adjust the, the layers that you're looking at. So uh, I like to click on the very last one that says labels layer. And so under each of these, you'll see um, different options that you can click on. So if um, it's colored red, that means it's not being shown. And if it's colored green, it means it is being shown. So I like to click on the boundaries, both the boundaries, and that's going to give you the state and international boundaries. And also, I like, I like to add the labels um, just so I can see kind of the city and state and um, uh, international names. OK. Um, so if we come over here, again, as I said, the default is the GO16 geocolor. You can see that's colored in green there, so we know it's being displayed. Uh, and there's a bunch of different options, but again, I want to focus on aerosol optical depth because that's what we're talking about today. So if we click on AOD, uh, we'll see that fill in. So the color bar will appear. Again, it's the, the, um, the rainbow color bar that you have been seeing. So again, colors of blue, dark blue and a lighter blue indicate a clean atmosphere. And when you start to see the yellow, orange and red colors, that indicates um, high aerosol optical depth from aerosols, typically from either smoke, blowing dust or urban haze. And so today it's a really clean day across the United States. Um, and so we can animate, again, we have the, the most recent approximately one hour worth of data. So if we come up here to the top, we see these blue buttons, there's an arrow right in the middle. We click on that, it will actually animate the imagery. So again, we're, we're looking at about the past hours worth of, of data. Okay. So because not too much is going on today, let me stop this. Um, I'm gonna go back a few days, about a month, and so we can look at a day when there was actually some aerosols in the atmosphere. But before I do that, I just want to, let me turn off the geocolor so you can see it a little bit better. Um, you might notice that this, again, this is the GOES-16, the GOES-E satellite. The aerosol optical depth cuts off over the western US. You can kind of see, um, see it here, hopefully approximately cutting off. Um, and that's because on aerosol watch, we're looking at the high plus medium quality AOD data. That's what's being plotted. And so because the Western US is 
quite far from the, um, the, the GO-16 satellite, um, data over the Western US here are considered low quality, and so they're not shown on the Aerosol Watch website. If you want to see aerosol optical depth over the Western US, what you would do is you come over, we're going to actually do this in a second, and you would click on GO-17, which is goes west, and then you would click on aerosol optical depth, um, and that will actually fill in the aerosol optical depth in the Western US. Okay, so let's look at, let's go back and let's look at a day when there was some, there was some uh, wildfire smoke in the Western US. Um, so to change the date, we would come up here to the calendar, um, and so we're going to go back actually to, let's see, what date did I pick? September 10th. Um, and so then we're going to click on September 10th. Um, and what that will do is that we'll actually, um, it'll automatically upload the same time range that you were just been visualizing. But I want to actually, I want to change the time. So to do that, you come over again to these blue buttons. And the one that has a clock on it, it'll say select animation range. If we click on that, it'll give us the option to, to show the start time and the end time. Um, and so here, you just, you don't want to pick too long of a time period. Um, like, for example, you wouldn't want to pick the whole day because um, you'll see the red, the red warning at the top. If you select too long of a time period, it just takes a really long time to load because it's a geostationary satellite. There's a very frequent observations. So my recommendation is start with an hour, maybe two hours worth of data, um, and then go from there, depending on, you know, what your, your internet connection is like, um, you'll be able to, to load more or less potentially uh, in terms of a range of data. So I want to go to uh, the afternoon. So I want to pick from 1731 UTC to 1831 UTC. So, so you just select your start and end times, and then you hit submit, and then that's going to load up automatically. And so we can see here, actually, first, let's look at the geocolor for a second. Let me turn off the aerosol optical deck. Um, and so let me just let me just run this as an animation. So hopefully you can see. I can zoom in a little bit. Can you can zoom in and out using the normal uh, your mouse or there's these little plus and minus uh, navigation menu up here. So hopefully you can see this very thick, almost brown colored smoke. Um, so these were some wildfires uh, that are occurring in the state of Oregon um, and have actually been burning for several months, but they were particularly intense on on this day on September 9th of this year. Um, and so what we can do there also, I should add, there were also wildfires in British Columbia and in the state of Washington as well. Um, so if we add the aerosol optical depth now, we can see, and I'm going to slow it down. So again, there's more controls up here. So these, these two double arrows, you click on those, they'll actually slow down the animation. And then the double forward arrows will speed up the animation, slow it back down again. And then if actually, if you want to stop, you can stop the animation. And then um, this arrow, this button here will allow you to step forward one time step. And then this will allow you to stop, to step backward one time step. So you can control the animation. So yeah, so if we do that, if we just step forward gradually. Uh, you can see the that smoke plume, the movement of it kind of surging northward, that, that big, huge one. And then there's also obviously transported smoke kind of all across the, the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Let me just skip through that a little bit more. Okay. So again, you can see in the very thickest smoke, there was that, that kind of anomaly that I was mentioning, that there's some missing AOD retrievals just because that smoke is so thick that the AOD algorithm is mistaking it for a cloud. That's just something to be aware of. Okay. But um, one thing that we can do, kind of a, a, a way to help circumvent that, um, is that if I turn off the aerosol optical depth, um, what we offer is what's called the aerosol optical depth composite. So let me turn that on. So what that is, is that's a three, well, it can be any, any averaging time. But on our website here, we offer it in three hour periods. So what we're looking at here is the 15 to 18 UTC AOD composite. So that's a three hour average of AOD from 15 to 18 UTC. So then if we go, then there's one from 18 to 21. So, so now we're looking at the, the average from 18 to 21 UTC. And so you can see that a lot of those um, gaps that are from the, the lack of AOD in the very thickest part of the smoke plume, um, those are filled in to a, to a certain extent when we look at the um, multi-hour AOD composite. So again, this is from 18 to 21 UTC. 
So we go back, you can see from 15 to 18 UTC. Okay. So that's that's pretty, and we'll, when we do the, the Python hands-on, we'll, we'll see how to make an AOD composite. That, that can be a really helpful way to kind of fill in some of the gaps from an individual time steps missing AOD retrievals, either because of clouds or because of something like this where there's a really thick smoke plume and all of the AOD isn't being retrieved. Okay, so let me just go back to the, 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 um, the AOD for each timestamp, and let me put this in motion again. Um, so let's just say, you know, you want to save this particular animation. Or maybe you want to, you need it for your research or for a presentation, or you want to put it on your website. So you just want to um, kind of get everything going, like the speed you want, the, the location that you want, the products that you want. Um, and then what you do is you come up to um, this little blue button with the camera on it that says save image. So we're going to click on that and that will turn our cursor into a little um, plus sign. And so we can use that to draw a box around the area that we want to save. And if you don't get the box quite right, you can actually adjust it. So don't worry about that. So let me make this go down a little bit further, maybe up a little bit more. So that looks pretty good. So when you have the, the, the box where you want to, you're going to come here and select submit. And a new tab is going to open on your browser, and it's going to take a few minutes. Um, it'll, you know, the time will vary depending on how long of the the data animation, the imagery animation you've selected, and then also, you know, your internet connection, your computer. So you'll see um, there'll be a little loading bar here um, that'll kind of give you an idea of where you are. And then once the animation is ready, you'll see it pops up here. And so then what you can do is you can either, of course, copy it. Or what I like to do is I like to um, save it. And so you can right click and then say, it looks like I've saved a whole bunch of stuff. So then you can just rename it whatever you want. And then you hit save. And now you have that GIF file, which for me is opening up in a different window here. There we go. Let's move over here. So now you have a GIF file with that animation. So that's really handy. Um, I know a lot of people, let me close that out again. A lot of people um, in part one in the Q&A were asking where they can retrieve or access um, the, the geostationary satellite data from the past, from the archive, and this is one really good place. Okay, so one other thing I want to mention, um, we've been looking at the, the CONUS sector imagery, so I'm going to hide the GO-17 again, and I'm going to go back to the GO-16 for this particular day. Um, it looks like it might take a minute for the geocolor to load up. Um, so you can see, hopefully you can see at the top right hand corner, there's the CONUS view sector, which we, we've been looking at, and then also there's a full disk sector. So for, um, for folks that, that don't live in southern Canada or the United States or Mexico, um, you know, there's a, I know there's quite a few participants from Central America and from South America. Um, you can come here and you can click on the full disk sector. Um, and this will show you, again, this, you know, the same thing, the geocolor, the AOD, we have the AOD composite imagery, um, and so you can use zoom in and out, okay, you can pan around. So on this particular day, um, there was quite a lot of seasonal burning occurring in the Amazon basin, so we see very high aerosol optical depth over a very wide, you know, area of Central South America um, that's associated with smoke from, if I can hide this, you can see hopefully the gray shading associated with smoke from those fires. So um, I'm anticipating for a lot of participants, um, this full disk uh, sector imagery will be very helpful for people. Okay, um, all right, so now I wanna move on and I wanna go back. Um, I'm gonna have a quick few more slides to talk about how we actually work with the AOD data themselves. All right, great. So, um, so now I would just like to give you a brief overview of, of the actual data files that we'll be working with, um, because there's some unique aspects about working with the GOES R ABI data files um, that are different from other data files, like for example, from polar orbiting satellites that you may have worked with. Um, so the first thing I want to mention is that all of this, the NOAA satellite data files, they're in net CDF format. Um, and so you may have encountered NetCDF files before. Um, NetCDF is a, it's a set of software libraries and data formats that are specifically for um, scientific data. Um, and so NetCDF files, they all have a common organizational structure, um, what's called a, a top level group or a root group. Um, and then the contents, um, they can be organized by additional subgroup, subgroups. 
but they but not necessarily. Um, the, the files that we're going to look at today, for example, won't have optional subgroups, but, but some NOAA satellite data files do. Um, but the data are organized as variables, um, and then the variables have attributes and dimensions. And the attributes and variables will have data types. And so we're going to see all of these different um, examples when we look at uh, an AOD data file today. Um, so we're, we're going to open up a file and we're going to actually look at the variables. We're going to look at some of the different data types and, and attributes um, and um, see the, the structure of the NetCDF file. All right, so ABI data files have a lot of information just in the file name um, and it can be a little bit complicated. So I just wanted to go over some of the, the information that you're going to encounter. Um, so the first um, kind of way that the data files are classified is by what's called the processing level. And so you've heard these terms before. So there's the level 1B data. Those are the ABI band 1 through 16 radiances. And then there's level 2 products. These are the products like aerosol optical depth that are derived from the level 1B radiances. All right. And um, then there's each of the different level 2 products have a product name. And you'll see examples of those in a minute. Um, and then there's the scan sector. So there's three scan sectors, and this is the like the domain of the data. So there's the full disk, which is the full hemispheric disk. There's what's called the conus sector, which is a subset of the full disk, typically that's covering the conus, um, the actual conus, or for goes west, it's called the packets. And so you can see examples here. So this is the goes east conus sector, um, and then this is the goes west packets sector, which is still considered the, the conus abbreviated C. It gets a little bit confusing, but again, we're going to open up these, some of these files. So you, you'll, you'll, I think you'll understand a little bit more when we start working, working with that specifically. Um, and then there's two adjustable zoom-in regions that are called mesoscale domains, um, and they are not constant. They're adjusted based on current hazards, okay? And we won't be working with those today because, as you remember, I mentioned the aerosol optical depth data, they aren't retrieved for the mesoscale sectors. Just this is the CONUS, um, and then again, this is an example of the, the full disk for goes east and then goes west. Okay, we also talked about um, the scan mode. Um, Dr. Gupta talked about that last week. So there's essentially four different scan modes um, for the, the GOES-R satellites, and that's what determines the observation frequency of the full disk, the CONUS, and the mesoscale sectors. So the most common one you're going to encounter is mode 6, um, which is abbreviated M6. That's called the flex mode. Um, and that's typically the default mode, all right? Um, and then, of course, there's the different satellites. There's GO-16, GO-17, and then GOES-18, which we'll be taking over for GO-17 in early January. Okay, so here's an example of, of what a ABI level 2 file name looks like. You can see it's really long, long name. So this schematic breaks it down so you can understand what the content is, because there's a lot of information here that will, will tell you about what's in the file, before you even open the file. So it's important to understand um, what, what the file name, how, how it breaks down, all right? Um, so the thing to, the most big things to notice is that um, first, this is telling us the sensor, the ABI, the Advanced Baseline Imager, that it's a level two product. And then here's the product name. And again, we'll see examples of these um, on the next two slides. But in this case, this is the AOD, aerosol optical depth, and it's the Kona sector data. Then we have the scan mode, this is mode six, so-called flex mode. The satellite, so this is either gonna be go 16, go 17, or goes 18. And then we have three times. So we have the observation start time, the observation end time, and then the time the file, the data file is created, all right? So the thing to notice here is that for whatever reason, <clears throat> those are ABI data files, use the Julian three-digit day. They do not use the two-digit month and then the two digit day of the month to designate times all right so that's just something we're going to have to keep in mind when we're working with the data okay oh and then finally their net cdf files of course all right so um there are about 20 abi level two products um and so i've listed them on this slide and the next slide just so you have them as an example um again we're going to be working with aerosol optical depth which comes in full disk sector and conus sector, there are no mesoscale sector um, aerosol optical depth data files. And if you want, really want to know more information, I included a link here to um, some of the product documentation for these different files. 
And then here's the, the rest of them. Uh, somebody last week asked about, um, in the Q&A, asked about uh, winds information from the, the satellites. So this is the derived motion winds uh, product that um, that person hope that is maybe interested in. Okay. All right. So specifically now, aerosol optical depth. Um, I just want to show an example. So again, can't say this enough times. A AOD is available for the full disk sector. And here's an example of what the full disk sector AOD data looks like for one time step. And then for the CONUS sector, and again, this is an example of what the AOD data looks like for one time step of the CONUS sector. Okay. Um, the full disk sector files are big. We're going to work with those today with Python. So they're about 30 to 40 megabytes. Um, again, both all AOD has two kilometer resolution at Nader. The observation frequency depends on the scan mode. Typically with that mode six flex mode, we get every 10 minutes, we get a full disk sector observation and every five minutes we get a CONUS view sector observation. And in the data files, um, in the, the AOD data includes high, medium and low quality data with the data quality flags. And we will see what those look like when we open up a file and we will actually use them today. Um, these examples here, these are both what we call the, um, the high quality. So you can see I, I put it in the, the title here. So this is just the highest quality data that's being shown in this example. Okay, um, so I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this, but anybody that's work, gonna be working with ABI data files, you just need to be aware that latitude and longitude of the observations um, they're not included as separate variables in the data files. And this is done to save, save file space, really. Um, and the reason why is because um, the, the GOES satellite, so GOES East or GOES West, um, they're on what's called a fixed grid. So the grid doesn't change, unlike for a polar orbiting satellite, where every time the satellite makes a new overpass, it's, you know, it, it, there's a different grid of satellite pixels on the ground. For the GOES satellites, that grid is fixed. And so um, that means that in the data files, the, all the information that's needed to, um, to calculate latitude and longitude are included in the data files, and you kind of have to do that calculation yourself. Um, so you can see some of the examples of some of the constants. Um, here's a, a diagram that shows essentially the relationship between the satellite and latitude and longitude. Um, we did this, this math for you, so I will, we, we'll see when we do the Python section. Um, how to actually calculate latitude and longitude from the information in the data file. But I just wanted you, anybody who's working with these files, I just wanted to, you to be aware of that. Okay, uh, we already talked about the Aerosol Watch website, but there's just a slide here to remind you if you're looking for prepared imagery already, that's where you wanna go. Okay, um, so, right. Maybe there are times when you actually wanna work with the data files directly yourself. So um, there's different places that you can go to actually download the data. Um, what we're going to use is um, NOAA has a new data archive on Amazon Web Services. Um, and that includes access to all of the level 1B radiances and all of the level 2 data files, including aerosol optical depth, which is what we're going to download today. All right. So I've just included the information here with the links. Um, you can actually go on a web browser and take a look um, at these different um, data archives for CISCO 16, 17, and 18. Um, it's free, it's easy, there's no registration required. Um, this is actually separate from um, an Amazon Web Services account. A lot of people will do uh, cloud computing on Amazon Web Services, and for that you need an account. This is completely different. This is a public archive that just happens to be housed on Amazon Web Services. Okay. Um, and it's part of NOAA's, what they're calling the Open Data Dissemination Program, um, which is NOAA's effort to make their satellite and other data files um, more accessible to the public. Yeah. All right, and then finally, I just wanted to mention, I have a new website. Um, we're still adding information to it, but if you have a question, um, you know, you're confused about something, uh, you're looking for an answer, try going to this website. There is um, a lot of information here. Uh, you can always you know, contact me, obviously, email me. But we have information um, about uh, working with Python, so setting up um, Anaconda and Jupyter Notebook. Um, I have some annotated tutorials talking about the different code that we're gonna cover today to work with the satellite data files. Um, information, more information on kind of what I've just covered about the different scan sectors and scan modes um, and the different domains and other information you need to know about the satellite data. 
um, and then a glossary that, that defines common satellite terms, uh, and then links to all sorts of reference information for satellites, imagery, um, Python packages, anything that you might need to work with the data. Okay. All right. So now what I want to do for the rest of my time that's allotted to me is I want to take you through some actual Python code to work with the data themselves. So what we're going to do is hopefully if we have time, we're going to actually um, learn the proper workflow for visualizing satellite data, specifically level two data files. And we're going to use aerosol optical depth as an example. So I want to show you how to do this from start to finish using Python. So the first thing that we want to do, number one, is we actually want to download the data files. And we're going to download them from that Amazon Web Services archive that I was mentioning. All right, and so we're going to use a case study um, from September 7th of this year. So we're going to download one hour's worth of full disk sector AOD data files. So that's six files. Um, and this is when there was a pretty intense seasonal burning in the Amazon. So there was a lot of very thick snow smoke across Central South America. Then we're going to open one of those data files, and we're just going to see how to read the metadata, how to understand what the data variables are, um, how is the, the data file organized, what information do you need to know to work with the data. Then number three, we're going to actually process and visualize. So we're going to make some maps, some images of the AOD data files. Um, and there's two different options. So we can make maps of the individual time steps. Um, or we can make a multi-file composite. Remember I showed you the composite with aerosol watch on the website? That just helps fill in some of the gaps because um, sometimes AOD is missing for individual time steps. So the AOD composite can kind of give you a more complete picture. Um, and then finally, if we have time, I'll show you how to, um, if we have our one hour's worth, our six maps of individual AOD time steps, we can actually put them together to make an animated GIF file, kind of make a little movie or an animation um, of those AUD maps. Okay. Um, and I should mention, you should have gotten all this information from the RSET team, but all of the code files that I've given you, they're not just specific to this case study. You can actually reuse them on, on your own. And I hope that you will. Um, okay. So something about that though, um, the main thing that I want to mention is that there's a big difference between writing code for yourself and then writing code for others to use. And so what I mean by that is that, you know, I, I get, we provided these, um, these code files to you. They're more complicated than they would be probably if you wrote them yourself. Okay. And the reason is because I've included a lot of extra functions um, and things to make it really easy for you to use them, you the user to use them, things that you might not necessarily put in if you were writing the code for yourself. Um, so error checks, um, I have a graphic user interface. Um, which you'll see when, when we do the hands-on. So just be aware, you you probably this is probably overkill for what your specific application is, but I just did that to make the, the training process a little bit easier, okay? Um, and just another thing, so we're going to use Jupyter Notebook. Um, if you want regular Python format.py code files, let me know and I can help you with that. Um, and then obviously there won't be enough time for me to go through everything, but I'll try to go over the major steps. And I have a lot of comments in the code, so hopefully you'll be able, you should be able to follow along on your own. Okay, um, so these next two slides, these are just there as a reference for you. So, um, you know, we're gonna download files specifically for that case study I mentioned from some, some September 7th. So um, just this, the information we're gonna use to, to download this files, so this is just here as a reference for you. Um, and then the same thing when we actually visualize the files, Again, we're going to focus on a specific area of Central South America, and, and so those um, specifications are just here for you to come back as a reference. Um, and so this is going to give you a flavor of what we're going to actually make today. Um, so I'm not sure if you can see this. So this is the animated GIF here on the, the left, um, focusing on um, one hour's worth of data over Central South America. Um, and then here we have this the, the composite, the six file composite um, image. So again, you can see there's a lot more of the, the AOD that's been filled in. There's a few gaps here and there in terms of um, different timestamps. Um, and those most of those gaps are filled in with the closet. And then also you can work with, so not only can you zoom into a specific region, you could also visualize the, the full um, domain, in this case, the full disk sector of AOD data. And this is just an example of that. This is the, the one hour composite, high and medium 
quality AOD data for the, um, the whole entire full disk, okay, which takes a lot longer. So what we're going to do, it takes about 11 minutes to make the six individual AOD maps if we're looking at the top two qualities AOD. Um, if you're going to do that for the full disk domain to make a composite, it takes about 20 minutes. It's just, it's a lot of data to process. All right, everybody. So hopefully those uh, participants who want to run the Python hands-on on their own computer um, and kind of go along with me while I'm doing it, hopefully you had a chance to uh, set everything up, um, make sure you had, have Anaconda installed on your computer, and set up a, a new folder on Jupyter Notebook that should look very similar to this, hopefully. So you should have uh, one, two, three, four, uh, five IPYMB files, and then one .py file. All right, and so hopefully you all actually already ran this check Python packages just to make sure that everything um, has was installed and ready to go. Uh, so let's let's assume that everybody has that set up. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to actually download the data files that we're going to work with today. So let's open up the, the file that's called ABI Level 2 Download AWS. And so to do that, we're just going to click on it, and it's going to open up in a separate tab on your browser. It might take a second or two for it to load up. All right, and so um, once it does, so the way that Jupyter Notebooks works for those of you who haven't used it before is that um, it's nice because it allows you to, to run each of these blocks, these gray um, squares separately from the other. So you can get output right away separately from the other parts of the, the, the code file. Um, so it's really great for, for beginners, for learning, and then also, I'm, I'm, I even use it myself often if I'm working with a new data file. So what we want to do is we want to click anywhere in the block that we want to run, uh, and then we come up to the top and see this run button with the arrow. We're going to click on that, um, and then any output from the, the block will appear underneath. Okay, so this, this first block, block zero, just has information about the, the code file. All right. So if we scroll down to block one, which says import Python packages. Um, so this is where we're going to import the packages that we're going to need to run this file. Um, and the one that I want to mention, I want to highlight is um, called S3FS. This is one of the ones that you had to install yourself. Um, so this is what's going to allow us to interface with the Amazon uh, Web Services uh, archive that contains the data files that we're going to download. OK, so let's run block one. Um, and then most of the rest of these blocks are just functions that I've written myself um, just to make it easy to download the data files. Um, and if I hadn't already, I should mention that this, this code file will allow you to download any of the ABI level two products. So that includes aerosol optical depth, uh, includes derived motion winds. Again, someone had asked about that in week one. Um, and then any of the other products, there's a fires product, for example, um, any of the other products that you might potentially be interested in, okay? Um, so block two, um, all this one does is that it, it allows us to enter the observation date that we want to download the files for in our normal month and day, and it's this function is going to convert that to the Julian day. So remember, the ABI data files are organized with the three-digit Julian day, so um, this is just going to convert that for us so we don't have to look it up ourselves. So let's run block two. Um, now, block three, um, what this is doing is, again, remember I said there's, al there's almost 20, I think, of those different um, ABI level two products. So what this function does is it finds the correct um, product abbreviation that we need that's part of the ABI file name. Um, we're going to put in, we're going to select what scan sector, either full disk, CONUS, or mesoscale. And then the, the product that we want, for example, aerosol optical depth. And then this function is going to return that abbreviation that we need um, in order to search for the data file name. So let's run block three. Um, so now block four, this is kind of where that the actual action happens. So in this function, this is where we're going to actually query um, right here. We're going to query the, um, the Amazon Web Services data archive. And we're going to actually get the list of file names that correspond to the search parameters, the, the day, the month, the year, the start time and the end time, the product, the scan sector, all that stuff that we put in to search for, 
this block right here, this function, is going to actually return the list of data files that correspond to those parameters. So let's run block four. Okay. Um, and so again, we're not seeing any output here because we're not going to see the output until the very end when we run the search. So you should, if you're not seeing any output from these when you run them, that is correct. That's what we want. Okay. Um, so block five, this is where we're, this is kind of an interface. So this is what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to run the search. Um, then we're going to get some output that says, here's the, the list of files and the file size for each one that matches your search parameters. Do you want to download these files? That way, like maybe you made a mistake, like you enter the wrong year or the wrong month by mistake. Then you're not downloading a bunch of data that you actually made a mistake and you don't really want. So we want to we want to review our search results and then decide to actually download the files. And so that's what this block is doing. So let's run block five. Okay. So block six. Um, this is what we run. This this is going to actually generate. Let's do it. Let's run block six. This is going to generate if you scroll up. So underneath block six, you should see um, menus that look like this. So this is where we're going to actually enter our search specifications, okay? So you just, you only have to run this block, block six, one time, okay, to generate the menus. Then if you change any of your search specifications, you don't need to rerun this block again. You just change it with the menus, um, and then all that information will automatically upload when we, we run the search itself, okay? So um, for the satellite, we're going to use go 16. Okay, follow along with me. And again, if you if you forget this or you're not doing this live, um, this search information is in the slides. The second to last slide um, has all the search information parameters that you want to enter here. Okay, so our product is aerosol optical deck. We're going to use we're going to do full disk. It's going to be 2022 September 7. And then let me just scroll down a little bit here. And we're going to start at 1400 UTC and we're going to end at 1450 UTC. Okay, so let me just, I'll, I'll let that sit there for a second so people can see that. Um, and then there's a choice. You can either download your files to the current working directory, um, which is what I want to do because that's going to download them into the same directory on your computer where we, ha we have these code files. So that'll be the easiest for the training, but maybe if you're, you're going to reuse those, these files at some point, you might want to specify a different directory on your computer. If you did that, you would, you would change this button here and then you would just type in the name of the directory. Okay. So we have Go16, Aerosol Optical Depth, Full Disk, September 7th, 2022, 1400 to 1450 UTC. Okay. So then if we scroll down to block seven, so this is the main function. This is where we're going to actually run the search. Um, and so if you have time and you look through this, you'll see there's some, some different error checks just to make sure that, um, like, for example, you're not searching for a day in the future or that you haven't specified an end time for the observation that's before the start time, just little things like that. Okay, so let's run this last block. That shouldn't be the case for us. So um, as I mentioned, you see what we have here is we have the list of files that are available and then their approximate file size. So you can see each one is about 30 megabytes. So they're they're not enormous, but they're they're you know they're not small. They're relatively large, um, and then this is going to again tell us where uh, we're actually downloading our, our data files. Just to double check the directory name, and then just double check that these are in fact the files you want to download. So here you can type you can type out yes, or you can just type Y to download those files, and you can see it's really quick. This is going to give us a little um, process bar to see how quickly we're processing them, what our progress is. You can see it was that fast, okay? At least on, on my computer. Maybe depending on the, you know your internet speed or your computer processing, it might take a little bit longer for you. But if we go back out now to the tab for our um, our original Jupyter notebook file, you should see you've got your six ABI AOD full disk sector files here, okay? All right. So then what we can do is we can just close this out. So there's two different things you could do actually. So you can, if you want to just leave this the way it is, you can just close it out. What I like to do is I like to come up to um, where it says cell um, and it says all output. You select all output clear. That's going to clear out everything from um, all the output from underneath each individual cell. 
okay? It's kind of like resetting it back to when you started. And then if you come up here to where it says file, you save and checkpoint, that'll save the file as if it were. So then when you use it again, um, you're not looking at the results from the last time you used it. So that's just a thing I like to do, but you don't have to. Okay, another thing that's nice, so hopefully you can see um, the little notebook here for the, the file that we just closed, it's green. That means the file is still running. So one thing you can do is you can click the little checkbox next to it, um, and that'll, um, a new menu will come up here. And so you wanna click the, the box that says kind of this orangish brownish color box that says shut down. And then you'll see now the little notebook, it went from green to a, like a black or dark brown. So that means it's closed. And again, that's not necessary, but it just, you know, if we're not using the file anymore, we can just close it down and kind of just release that memory, that computer memory back for us. Okay, so now let's actually open up one of these files and see what's inside. So now I'd like you to please open up the file that says ABI AOD open understand. Okay, and so this one's a little bit different. So the one, the previous one we looked at was more like a script where we actually were running a bunch of functions that I wrote, and then we were kind of running the search at the end and getting results. Here, we're gonna get um, output every, uh, you know, when we go along. Um, and so we're gonna actually um, see the results of, of our uh, Jupyter Notebook blocks underneath the blocks printing out as we go along, okay? So again, the first one, if we, we click on uh, block zero and we run it, we'll just see some information about the, the file itself. So let's go down to block one, um, where we're gonna import our Python packages. And the package I wanna point out here um, is called NetCDF4. This was another one of the packages that you had to, to install yourself directly. Um, and so NetCDF4, this is the package that we're gonna actually use to open up the, the NetCDF data file um, and take a look inside. So let's run block one. All right, so block two, um, here's where we're gonna actually open up the file. So um, first what I'm doing is I'm setting the directory where the data files are. And so again, we're using the current working directory. That's where our data files are. If you had a different directory that wasn't your current, current working directory, you would just change this information here. Um, and then the file name, um, this is one of the files that we just downloaded. It's the first one, the observation for 1400 UTC. If you wanted to look at a different file, you would just change this name. Um, and then this is right here. This is this data set file name. This is the, the command that's going to actually open up the data file using the netcdf4 Python package or Python library. So let's run block two. Okay, so we didn't do anything yet. We just opened the file. So now in block three, let's print the metadata, the global metadata for the entire file. And the way we do that is we just say print and then the, basically the, the file that we just opened. Okay, when we do that, you should see a whole lot of text print out underneath that block. So you can read through it. There's all sorts of information. You know, it tells you all about um, the, you know, about NOAA, about the the, the uh, satellite itself, about its resolution, all sorts of good stuff. You scroll down, scroll down. You, you just read it. There's a whole bunch of stuff. Okay. What I want you to take a look at is we get down towards the bottom. You should see something that says variables in parentheses dimensions. Okay, so remember I told you that um, that CDF4 files have a common structure, um, and one of the things that they have is variables. So here, all this whole list here, those are all the variables that are in this particular file. You can see there's a lot of them. Okay, so we're going to focus on a few. So we're going to focus on AOD right here. Okay, that's the aerosol optical depth, and then also the DQF, that's the data quality flags. Uh, and then somewhere is X and Y, which is not popping out already right now. Here we go. There's Y and there's X. Okay, those are the ones that we're gonna focus on. But you could, if you wanted to come back on your own and take a look at some of these other ones, like the angstrom exponent, which is AE. Um, there's two of them, AE1 and AE2. You could come back and you start, you could, you, you could look around um, at all these different variables on your own, okay? But for the sake of time, let's just focus on the ones that are relevant to us today. So block four, let's take a look at the, the metadata specifically for the AOD, AOD variable. Okay, so when we do that, we see that it's aerosol optical depth of 550 nanometers. We can see there's a valid range, which looks, looks a little funky. Remember I told you that 
the valid range of the AOD data was minus 0 0.05 to 5. Well, that doesn't look like minus 0 0.05 to 5. Hmm, I wonder what's going on there. We'll come back to that, okay? Um, so units equals one, that means that there's it's dimensionless, there's no units. And we have some other information down here. We noticed that we're using the GOES imager projection. Remember I said there's no latitude and longitude, but we use the GOES imager projection in these files. So again, we'll see what that means. And then there's some other information. Oh, the other thing is, so the shape down here, so this is telling you that essentially the dimensions of the, the file. So this is a full disk file, so it's quite large. Okay, so we have 5424 by 5424 pixels. Okay. All right, so, so to go back to this funny valid range, okay. So if we look up here, we'll see that um, the AFD data are in, in units, or excuse me, in um, a data type of unsigned integers 16. That's what this is. So it's there's 16 bit unsigned integers. That's the data type of the AOD data. Okay. So what that means is, is that the AOD data are not stored as floating point numbers in the data file. They're stored as unsigned integers. All right, and that's what this data range is, is representing. So this is the data range, not in floating point numbers, but in um, unsigned integers, okay? So the, 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 um, the metadata include this scale factor and add offset, can you see here? So what we need to do is we need to, to multiply the valid range by the scale factor and then add the add offset, and that will convert the, the unsigned integers to floating point numbers, all right? So let's do that in block five. That's, that's what we're gonna do. And when we do that, we see, okay, great. Now this makes more sense, right? So the data range is minus 0 0.05. And then essentially what this is, if we round up, this is five, okay? Python does some funky things with floating point numbers, but essentially this is five, okay? So that's just something to remember that in, in these data files, the AOD data, you always want to take a look at what the data type is, okay? If you see a scale factor and add offset, that means that the data are not stored as floating point numbers, okay? Now, one nice thing about the NetCDF4 package that we're using is that it automatically, I have it right here, okay? So it, it does a couple of things. First of all, it automatically masks pixels with missing data, um, or they're outside the valid range, and it automatically applies the scale factor and add offset to convert the stored integers to floating point numbers. So we don't actually manually have to do that here. Um, if you, you were to use a different um, programming language like IDL or R, for example, you would have to manually multiply the AOD array by the scale factor and then add the add offset value, okay, to convert the stored integers to floating point numbers. Okay, we don't have to do that. So we're going to print out. Um, so first of all, we're going to read in the, the AOD data itself. Uh, then we're going to print out a snippet of the array near the center of the array so we can see some values. Um, and then we're going to print out the maximum and minimum values in the array. And then we're just going to check the shape just to make sure everything looks like it should. So let's do that. If we run block seven, or excuse me, block six. So here we can see, sure enough, these are floating point numbers. So this is a snippet of the AOD data array near the center of the array. Um, and so we can see that these are in fact floating point numbers, okay? And then we can see in this particular array um, it has really high AOD data, essentially the AOD data are five. Um, it goes down to the, the minimum of, of AOD data. And um, notice that the, the shape of the array is exactly the same as what the metadata we saw in a few blocks ago what the metadata told us. So, so that's good news. All right, so next, I just wanted to show you the data quality flag variable. So if we run that, um, you can see again, this is the, the data quality flags, okay? So this is also an unsigned integer, but um, the valid range is from zero to three. So we don't have to worry about any sort of conversion. These aren't floating point numbers. They are actually, the data themselves are actually integers. And down here, we can see the flag values. So the values um, and then the meanings. So zero corresponds to high quality data. One corresponds to medium quality data. Two corresponds to low quality data. And then three corresponds to no retrieval, okay? 
And so if we do the same thing in block eight as we did before, we print out a snippet of the array and we print out the maximum and minimum, we can see here, so here are the, the data quality flag values that correspond, I'm gonna scroll up, to the AOD data that we printed out here. All right, and so you notice that um, there's four, whoops, I should do right here, four pixels that are missing. That's what these dashed lines mean, that there's no AOD data retrieved for those particular pixels. And if we scroll down, we'll notice that those for those four pixels, the data quality flag is three. And three means no AOD retrieved. Okay, so that makes sense. So if you're, if you're, you know, again, you just want to print out a small part of the array, just to kind of check and see what the contents are. This is a really helpful thing to do. Okay. So we're going to do the same thing now, scrolling down to block 9 and block 10. We're going to do the same things now for the X and Y variables. Um, so X and Y are the, the variables that you need, among other constants. Um, you need those in order to be able to calculate latitude and longitude. So um, X is the, um, the GOES fixed grid projection X coordinate variable. So we'll print it out. We'll see it does, again, it has a scale factor and add offset in units of radians. Um, and so uh, you'll see this is just an example of the data array. Again, the, the net CDF4 package is automatically applying that scale factor and offset and converting um, the X variable to floating point numbers. And then if we do the same thing in block 10 for the Y, the Y variable, uh, again, it's, it looks very similar, except that it's the, the Y coordinate, which is why it's called Y. And again, we can see that it as actually it's um, the net CDF four package is converting um, the stored integers to floating point numbers. Okay, so if we scroll down to block eleven, remember I promised you that you wouldn't actually have to on your own calculate latitude and longitude. Um, so that's what this function here um, that that I've written called degrees. Um, it's going to read in the x and y coordinates variables. It's going to read in um, all of the constants associated with the GOES imager projection. Um, and then it's going to do a bunch of math and it's going to actually calculate the latitude and longitude. So let's run block 11. Okay. Um, and then we won't have any output there. So in block 12, what we're going to do is we're going to actually apply that function to that same snippet of values in the, um, in the middle of the array near the center. Um, so we're going to print out the latitude and then the longitude corresponding to that, that uh, same part of the, the data array that we looked at for the AOD data and the data quality flags. So let's run that. That might take a few minutes or a few seconds, not a few minutes. Just because it's a big file. So what it's doing is it's the function is actually calculating the latitude and longitude for all of the pixels. And then it's just printing out the, the snippet. So again, we can see, see here's the, um, the small, the snippet near the center um, corresponding to the latitude values for that part of the array. And then we, again, we can see for the whole array, the, the maximum latitude value and the minimum latitude value. And we check the shape. It's, it's the same shape as we saw for the AOD, and the data quality flag data array. So that's good. Um, and then here is the, the, uh, the snippet of the longitude values, again, near the center. Um, so they're around minus 75 uh, degrees longitude. And again, the, the GOES-16 satellite is centered at minus 75.2. So, so that's about right. Again, we're looking at this roughly at the center of the array. So we would expect the longitude to be around minus 75 point degrees and also the latitude to be very close to zero degrees, the equator, which is what they are, okay? Uh, and then the whole, you know, the entire, entire range is going to span the goes east full disk sector. So we're going to go from about six degrees longitude to minus 150, almost 157 degrees longitude. Okay. All right. So again, this is just information purposes for you. Um, you can use some of these same basic commands to, to look at any of the variables. Again, if I scroll up here, um, you know, any of these variables that you might be interested in. Um, you can actually um, use this same sort of um, syntax. You would just change the variable name and that will allow you to print out the metadata um, and then to actually, um, for example, you know, read in the data itself 
and then print out you know part of the array or, um, or the minimum and maximum values in the shape. Okay. All right. So again, I like to clear the output and then save it before I put it before I close the file. You may wish to, to keep the, the information and then save it. And then I'm going to close that. Okay. All right. So um, now that we've downloaded the data files and we've opened one up, um, so we know what's inside, let's actually kind of put all that together and let's actually map process and then map the data. So go ahead and open up the ABI AOD process visualize file. Okay. And so this is another one where um, most of the blocks contain functions that I've written. And we won't see any output for those until the very end when we run, the, we put everything together and we um, initialize the, the visualization of the, the data files. So, um, so I may step through them relatively quickly in the interest of time. Um, but again, if we start with block zero, that just gives us some information uh, about the, the, the code file itself. Block one. So we're going to import Python packages. You'll see there's a, a lot more packages than there have been for the, the previous files because we're going to be doing a lot. We're going to be doing kind of a lot more things in this particular file than we have in the previous ones. Um, the main ones to point out um, are matplotlib, which is the library to make plots, and then also cartopy, which is a library to create maps and work with map projections. All right, so that's one block one. All right. So block two, this is where we're going to read in our AOD data. Um, so some of this will look very similar to what we just saw in the previous file. We're going to read in the AOD data. We're going to read in the data quality flags. Um, and then we're actually going to apply um, the data quality flags to the AOD data so that we can either work with high quality only data, um, what we call top two, which is again the the high plus medium AOD data, and then all what we call all qualities, which is high plus medium plus low. Okay. So that's so this is the, the syntax for how we do that in Python. Uh, then we're going to again, you just saw this. So the rest of this block is applying the uh, the function to calculate latitude and longitude. Um, and then we're going so we're going to be left with as a result of this particular block, we're going to get our AOD data, we're going to latitude, and we're going to get longitude. So let's run that. Um, so block three, this is the same thing, um, except that we're going to calculate that AOD composite. So essentially what we're going to do is we're just going to run a loop, and we're going to actually read in the AOD data, the data quality flags data. We're going to select the AOD data using the data quality flags. Um, but we're going to do that for more than one data file. And then when we're done, we're going to average the AOD data together. So we get this multi-file composite. All right, so let's run that block. Um, so block four, this is just information about the projection. Because um, the way I set this, this file up, um, based on requests from end users, is they wanted to be able to plot the data with the native geostationary projection. And then they also want to be able to plot it um, with a different map projection called plate carré, which is it's a so-called flat projection. It's an equidistant rectangular projection. Um, so block four, this is just reading in the information about the native geostationary map projection. So let's run block four. Um, block five is um, we're going to create a color bar for our aerosol optical depth data. Um, and so there's a I wrote this function. There's a lot of um, special things about this color bar. Um, so I put them in the, the, the comments. If anybody has any questions, feel free to email, email me about them. Just, again, special things that are kind of make it easier for you to work with the color bar. Um, block six, we have to set up contours for when we plot the AOD data. Um, so we're assuming that we're going to display the data, the AOD data from zero to one. Um, and so we're going to display um, the data in intervals of 0 0.05. So if you wanted to change the range, the AOD range, or you want to change the contour interval, this is where you would do that in block six. Okay, let's run that. Block seven here, we're going to add, we're basically going to kind of set up the way the map looks. So we're going to draw coastlines. We're going to draw borders on the map. Um, we're going to shade the land. Uh, a light gray color, and then the oceans, so, sorry, the, the land a gray color, and the oceans a light gray color. 
So if you wanted to change anything about the appearance of the maps, um, block seven, this is where you would do that. Um, block eight, um, this is where we're going to set up, oops, excuse me, it's moving here. This is where we're going to set up the, um, the, the latitude and longitude grid for when we use that plate carré map projection. Um, and so this is going to allow us to set longitude ticks and latitude ticks um, around the map. And if you wanted to, some people like to put latitude and longitude grid lines on the map and some people don't like them. So I've set it up where we don't have any, any grid lines. If, you, if you're one of those people that does like them, you would just come down to this section of the code and you would uncomment these three lines. Uh, and that will actually place grid, mark, or grid lines on the plot. Okay, so that, that option is there for you if you're interested in it. Let's run block eight. So block nine, this is the same thing, except we're doing it for the geostationary domain. So we're setting up the, um, the latitude and longitude tick marks. Um, and then there's the option for the grid lines. Again, if you want the grid lines, you would either delete or comment out these two lines right here. So let's run that. Um, so this is making a title for your plot um, using information. Most of it is information that's in the actual data file itself. So we're gonna pull out the dates, the time of the observation, the satellites, um, and some other things from the actual file name. So let's run block 10. Uh, and then the same thing for block 11. This is for the composite plots. So um, if you make a composite AOD plot, it's a little bit more complicated to make the title because it's a range of time. So you just need to make sure you get the kind of starting time and ending time. Um, so let's run block 11. Okay, so then we get to block 12, 13, 14, and 15. Um, there's four different functions that are going to be plotting the data, right? And again, this is probably more complicated than you would do on your own because, again, I'm, I'm trying to meet requests that I've had from end users. So the first one, block 11, this is going to plot AOD data from a single file on the plate carré map projection. So let's run block 12. Block 13 um, is the same. It's going to plot AOD from a single file but on the native geostationary map projection. So let's run block 13. Um, block 14 is now going to plot the AOD multi-file composite on the plate carré map projection. Let's run block 14. And then finally block 15, this is gonna plot the multi-file AOD composite on the native geostationary map domain. So let's run block 15, okay? So again, there's basically four different options that you can use to make to, to visualize the data and make these maps. All right, block 16, again, this is just a, an interface, essentially. So again, before we make the plots, just like when we downloaded the data, um, we're gonna get a chance to kind of look everything over and make sure it's what we want before we actually say, yes, let's, let's make these, these maps. All right, just to give us a chance to look everything over in case we made a mistake. So let's run block 16. All right, block 17. Um, again, this is the one where, we're, another one where we're gonna make menus. Um, so let's run block 17, and underneath that, you should see uh, a somewhat long uh, list of menus that will allow you to enter the visualization options. Okay, so let's go through these. So the first one is we want to, to tell Python where the ABI data files are located. So we have then the six files in the current working directory. Again, if you were going to reuse this file, this code file on your own, you might have a different directory where you have the data files then you would click that and then just type in the, the name of the directory. But we're gonna use the current directory directory. Um, and then the, 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 we're gonna select the directory we wanna save the, the map image files that we're gonna make. So again, let's put them just for ease in the current working directory. If you were to reuse this data file at some point or this code file, I should say at some point, you may wanna put those files that you're making in a different directory and you could specify that here. Okay. All right. So again, I encourage you to come back on your own and play with different combinations here. Um, you know, look at the different AOD data qualities. Um, so try multiple different types of, of map types. Um, but for right now, in the interest of time, we're gonna keep this as individual AOD data files. We're going to select high and medium data qualities, so the top two qualities. For the image file format, it doesn't matter, whatever one you prefer. 
Um, I like PNG files, so I'm just going to keep it there. For the map resolution, I suggest starting with 150 or 300. Um, the, the higher the DPI setting here, the longer it's going to take the, the, the map files to be created and also the, the bigger the file size. So probably for everyday use, you don't need anything more than 150 or 300. I'm going to pick 300. All right. So again, I would encourage you to come back and try plotting the, the full disk sector. Um, it's gonna, these are full disk data files, so it's going to take a kind of a while to plot those. Um, so in the interest of time, let's actually zoom in on a specific area of Central South America. So we're going to select the option that says specify map domain manually, and then we're going to enter all the settings below. Okay, so let me scroll down a little bit here. Actually, I think I can leave it like this. All right. So um, in terms of the, uh, the, 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 basically the quarters of the domain, all right, so we're going to um, plot from minus 80 to minus 50, and then um, we're going to keep the northernmost latitude zero, and the southernmost latitude is going to be minus 25 degrees. Okay? Um, in terms of the latitude and longitude tick marks, so um, this is basically just setting the, the ticks that will be uh, around the edge of the map. Um, so the way this works is that you're going to set in essentially the, the range from west to east of your longitude ticks and then the increment between ticks. So we're going to go from minus 80 to minus 50 degrees longitude, and we're going to have that in increments of 10 degrees. So that'll plot minus 80, minus 70, minus 60, and minus 50 degrees longitude on our map. And for the, the latitude ticks, so the northernmost latitude again is going to stay zero, that's the equator. The southernmost one is going to be minus 20. And again, we're going to keep 10 degrees latitude between ticks. So then we'll have plot. So we'll have ticks at minus 20, minus 10, and zero degrees on our map. Okay, so let me just let me just leave that up there for a second so everybody can get a chance to, to take a look at all those. And again, on the, the last slide from the slide presentation file has all the, the specifications, all these um, uh, values that you can use to enter if you if you didn't get a chance to see them all or you want to go back and, and run it again on your own later. Okay, so once we have that all set up, then we scroll down to block 18. This is the last block. This is the main function. So again, we have a bunch of, of basically checks just to make sure that our directories are real. We haven't made a mistake entering a directory and that we don't have any other problems. And then we're going to actually make the maps. So let's run this block. And again, it's going to it's just the code is just going to tell us where are we saving our map files, use that directory we want. In this case, we're, we're going to be subsetting or excuse me, plotting a subset of the AOD data. We're not plotting the whole domain. We're just plotting a subset. And that subset corresponds to these map corners here. So west longitude, east longitude, southernmost latitude, northernmost latitude. Um, and then here's what our uh, longitude ticks are going to look like. And here's what our latitude ticks are going to look like. So everything looks good to me. Um, and so we're going to hit, actually, let me back up. So let's just say you made a mistake. Like maybe you entered the wrong, um, the wrong longitude value for the westernmost longitude. All you would do is you would say, actually, you, would, you guys don't do this. I just want to show you what would happen. You would hit no, OK? And then this will just end. It'll say, OK, we're not making maps. And then all you would do is you would scroll back up. And you would change whatever mistake you made. So again, let's say um, you know you you entered the wrong longitude value here. You would just change that value. I'm not going to do it because this is the one we want. But you would just change that, and then you would scroll back down to block 18, and you would run it again. Okay. And then again, you double check. Say, okay, yes, this is what I want now. And then we're going to type Y for yes, and it's going to start plotting the data. All right. So I just want to show. Um, while those those images are are running, I just wanted to show the participants a few examples of um, what they can do, other options, um, maps that they can make um, using the same uh, code file. So um, this is an example here of the um, the full disk, so plotting the full domain of data. Um, so this and this is also the multi-file composite. So this is showing for high and medium quality AOD. Um, this is the, the six file 1400 to, 4, to 1450 UTC composite of the full disk data. Um, and then we can see 
um, in comparison, um, this is just the high quality AOD. All right. And so, the, and this is also a JK file, and the other one was a PNG file. All right. So, um, looking at the differences again, this is the high quality, um, and then this is the, the top two qualities. And so, the difference with the high quality is that um, it's the most stringent. So, there's slightly less um, coverage in terms of the AOD data uh, compared to the top two qualities. Okay, so let's check. Oh, okay, so here's, we check back on our, our code. Um, as the, the AOD um, data files are being generated, you'll see them appear uh, underneath the, um, the code block as output. And then if we go back to um, our, our current working directory, so our, our directory on Jupyter Notebook, um, we'll see, start to see those image files being generated and saved. There's the first one right there. Okay. All right, just a couple other while we're waiting. Um, so this is an example. Um, remember I mentioned the, um, the option for the grid lines. So some people like to include the latitude and longitude grid lines and some people don't like them. So if you're one of the people that does like them, um, I pointed out in the, um, in the two functions where we're setting up the latitude and longitude tick marks, um, there are options there that you can either um, hide or, or uncomment, depending on which one, um, code uh, commands, a couple lines of code um, that will add these, these grid lines if you want to see them. Okay. Um, and then let's see, what's the other option? Oh, I think I just wanted to show the difference between this is the high quality AOD, all right, just the high quality only. And again, you can see um, it's, the, it's, it's got a lot of coverage, but it's the most stringent. So if we look at the high plus medium quality AUD, it has a little bit more coverage um, compared to just the high quality AUD. It might be a little faint to see, but this is an example that has the grid lines. So you can kind of see them. They're just faint, um, light gray lines, grid li latitude and longitude grid lines on the full disk um, uh, map of the AUD data. So again, for people that want to add the grid lines, that option is available for you. And this is an example of what they like. So they're, they're subtle. I like them, but a lot of end users don't like them. So, and that's fine. Everybody obviously has their own preferences or, you know, specific um, requirements for their application. Okay. So again, um, we can see as we're going along now, we have the 1410 UTC map that has been made. All right, everybody. So um, somewhere in the range of 11 to, in this case, it took me about 17 minutes this time. Um, you should see um, the, the six individual maps uh, print out uh, underneath the, uh, the final block. And so when it's very done, you'll see the words done. Um, and then if you go back to your current working directory, um, you should see the six. Uh, I, again, I, I selected PNG, but if you did JPEGs or PDFs, you'll see those six um, image files um, in your current working directory. Um, and then you, obviously you can open up any one of them individually. But what I'd like to do now is um, I'd like to show you how to, uh, to create a, a little movie or a, a animation as a GIF file. So again, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna close the visualize. Uh, I'm not gonna save it, so we'll just leave that. And then again, I like to actually close out and shut down the file before I open the next one, so let's do that. Um, and so then the very last one, let's open up animate images. This is, this is very short. I know we're running a little bit longer um, in terms of time than uh, I budgeted. So this one's really fast. So there's three different options that I've given you. I'm gonna run block zero. So there's three different options I've given you in Python to make animations, all right? And so um, in terms of importing the libraries, one of them is called um, Imagio, uh, and then we're gonna also use matplotlib to make an animation. Um, and then uh, the final one is called um, PIL or Python image library. So let's run block one. Um, so blocks two, three, and four, um, they're identical, um, except that uh, the only thing different between them is that each one is using a different one of those packages to create the animation. So block two is using um, the package called Imagio. And so for all of them, we essentially do the same thing. We read in the list of, of image files that we've created. In this case, we have six AOD maps that we made. 
Um, and then um, we, whatever the function is, it's going to put them together and make a GIF file, and then it's going to save the file. So let's run block two. That's for Imagio. Again, block three is using Pillow or Python image library. It's the same thing. We read in the image files, we make the GIF, and we save that GIF file. So let's run that one. Block four, um, again, it's the same thing, but now we're using matplotlib. It's a little bit more complicated because it's matplotlib, um, and we have to actually set up a figure um, and do some other things so that we don't actually see the axes, but the concept is the same. We're reading in our image files, um, we're making the animation, and we're saving the GIF file. So let's run that block. Again, block five, when we run that, this is, uh, again, our graphic user interface menus. Um, this is where we're just going to select the different options for making the animation. So first, we have to specify where the graphics files are located, and that's going to be the same directory where the animation, the GIF, is going to be saved. So in this case, we're using the current working library. That's where all of your uh, AOD map image files should be. Um, here, you can just, whatever name you want for the animation, um, I'm just going to call it, I'm just going to call it animation. You can call it whatever you would like. Um, that'll just, you know, dif differentiate when you save the file. So again, there's three choices. I would encourage you to, to redo this three times and see what the animation looks like using each of these. Um, let's do Imagio first. Um, and then you can set the time interval between your frames. Again, I just did, you know, half a second all the way up to five seconds. You could change this if you want. I like one second. Um, and then you have to, we have to specify what the, uh, the file type is for those, those um, map files that you made. So I made PNGs. Um, if you made a JPEG or a PFD, then you would want to specify that. Okay, and then we're going to come down to the main function. Again, there's a bunch of error checks for you. Um, we're going to run Max, and it's really fast. Um, and when it's done, it'll say animation done. Um, and then we're going to, again, we'll go back to our, uh, our current working directory, and you should see a GIF file with whatever name you designated. And then it'll have also, I just did this so you, would, you wouldn't be overwriting files. It'll have the package that was used to make the animation. So again, if we click on that, I'm going to... I'm going to actually pull it up, pull the actual file up from my Windows folder so I can just show you what it looks like. So that's the, this is an example of what of what the GIF that we just made, what it looks like. So you can see it's slowly repeating every one second between frames. Okay. Um, so again, I would encourage you to go back and um, try making it with um, with the, the pillow, the Python image library. And with matplotlib, maybe change the number of seconds between frames, see what you like, um, try the, the three different options just to see what they all look like. Each one has their strengths and weaknesses. Um, some of them are better for um, uh, images that have a continuous color bar. Some are better for a discrete color bar, you know, individual colors. Play around with them and see what you like. Okay, um, so I, I hope that that was helpful. Um, I, again, I had to go through the Python pretty quickly, but if you have any specific questions, um, certainly the Q&A is coming up now, or you can feel free to contact me directly. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Emmy. That was a great presentation, and we had a uh, a lot of questions so we'll move to the question answer session now if you have not put your question answer please put that in your question answer section uh, using the um, go to webinar option and we will display the question answer on the screen and then uh, dr emmy will take one question at a time she will read the question and then responds to it thank you emmy you can begin anytime okay thanks Pally. can you guys hear me okay hi everyone Thanks so much for attending. I hope that was helpful. Yeah, uh, we we can hear you. Q&A, so let me get started. Uh, so the first one was, how do we match different AOD retrieval algorithms from different satellites, or are they, or are they matched by design or default? Um, I wasn't sure what um, this, the person who asked this question, what they meant by matched, um, but the AOD algorithms, they're developed for each specific satellite, and that's because each of the this, I should say satellite sensors. Each of the sensors have slightly different um, wavelengths, you know, bands or channels, as um, Dr. Powan talked about last week. 
Um, so the AOD algorithms are slightly different for each sensor, but they're, they're all um, typically based on um, what we call heritage. So one of the first um, multi-channel AOD algorithms that was developed was the MODIS AOD algorithm. And so that's one of the heritages that the modern satellite sensors, um, the algorithms are built on, and also the early VIRS AOD algorithm. So the ABI AOD algorithm is, is based on the heritage of both MODIS AOD and the early VIRS AOD algorithms. Um, and I put some references um, in there uh, in the, the answer, just in case anybody had any questions about that. Want to you know look, look up and read some of those papers. Okay, so the next question is actually, could you, yeah, could you scroll? Thank you. Um, so the next next question is question two. I am interested in gridded PM two point five data at the fine spatial resolution over South Asia and India. Can you please suggest any data sets available or are going to be available in the near future for this part of the globe from NASA? Um, and so uh, we put a, a link there in the chat. Um, or excuse me, in the, the answer to the, the question. So you can access the global monthly and annual PM2.5 data sets at one kilometer resolution um, from that, that link there. All right, so question three on slide 12, um, what is the diagonal edge inside the visible image on the right? Um, so I can actually show that. Can you guys remind me how to share my screen? So can you see the, the so this is the that same, um, Beer's true color image that I was showing in the slides. And so the person is asking about this kind of um, a very noticeable diagonal line here, kind of going right through the area of smoke that's coming off. This is the coast of the Western United States. This is Washington State here, um, and then Oregon and California. Um, and so what this line is here, this is actually um, due to the overlapping um, VIRS swaths or, or areas of observation um, that are adjacent. So as you, you guys probably remember from last week, um, so this is a VIRS image. This is from the SNPP satellite, which is a polar orbiting satellite. And so polar orbiting satellites, as they orbit around the, the Earth, each time they complete an orbit, they're looking at a new area of the Earth's surface. Um, and so this just happens to be um, this area here off the coast, um, the area where two of those observation swaths overlap. And so because adjacent swaths are approximately 90 minutes apart, um, so that's why there's actually been about 90 minutes between this observation here closer to the coast um, and then the one further off the coast. And so that's why you see this line because um, in 90 minutes, this smoke plume has moved, it's shifted slightly. And so that's why you see this discontinuity here. Okay, so if we were to look at, this is the SNPP, if we were look, to look at the NOAA 20 VIRS observation, um, you see there isn't that discontinuity in the same place. It's a little bit, hopefully you guys can see that, it's a little further offshore um, because the NOAA 20 and SNPP satellites, they're, they're offset by about 50 minutes. So their, their swaths, their observation areas um, are, are slightly different. So um, probably, I guess, for the, the presentation, I should have shown the NOAA 20 image. We wouldn't have had that line right through there, but I didn't think of it. So that's a great question. Thank you. Okay, so let's go back to the questions. That was an excellent question. Okay, question four. Uh, what is the maximum of ABI AOD which can be retrieved in the algorithm? Uh, five, can you extend to a higher number? Um, actually, yes, I guess I can stop showing my screen here. Probably you don't need to, to see that. Um, so yes, so five is, as I mentioned in the slides, five is the maximum ABI AOD value. Um, the algorithm actually does retrieve values higher than five, but the uncertainty um, is, is very high. In the algorithm, there's something called a lookup table, which actually matches the the, uh, the observed information from the ABI uh, spectral bands that corresponds to then the AOD models that give us the actual AOD value. So, so that table only goes up to five. So that's why ABI AOD is only reported as a maximum value of five, um, just because that's the, the, the highest value that we have confidence in. Okay, question five. Is it possible to use the GOES database and the Aerosol Watch platform for retrieving and analyzing fog events? Um, what would be the main limitation in using AOD observations from satellites to analyze fog? 
Um, I would not recommend using AOD for fog. AOD is not, it wasn't designed to, to monitor fog. Um, so instead, I would say there actually are quite a lot of um, products that have been developed specifically for fog because, of course, fog is a major issue for operational weather forecasters. So I put some links there. Um, so, so the main products that are applicable are what are called uh, composite imagery products, or they're abbreviated as RGB. That stands for red, green, blue. Um, and so these, these RGB products um, are developed specifically for fog. Um, so I put a couple of links there. There's one called a day snow fog RG, RGB. Um, and then the other one is the, um, I forget what it's called now. It's like the, the night micro uh, imagery. I can pull it up here again. Uh, nighttime, that's what it's, nighttime microphysics RGB imagery. So that one's good at night. And then the day snow fog imagery is useful during the day. So that's what I would recommend using those instead. All right, question six, how do I get the AOD data and CSV format from the Aerosol Watch website? Unfortunately, that is not an option from Aerosol Watch. You can only download the imagery files from Aerosol Watch. We do not have an option where you can download the data and CSV format. Uh, question seven, are Aerosol Watch's downloadable animations geo-referenced? Um, so, so, so you can either, I, sh I demonstrated how to download an animation. You could also just download a static image. So just instead of animating the imagery, you could just have one, one time step. Um, and so either of those are going to be either the, the static image, the one time step is going to be a PNG file, or the animation is going to be an animated GIF. Um, and so those are geo-referenced um, in the sense that they will include the layer layers with the international and, and state and local boundaries and also the place labels if you include those um, layers under the labels layer tab. So if I could share my screen again, I can just point that out for folks. Let me, let me pull that up here, just show you exactly where that is. So remember, when you open Aerosol Watch, it's going to look something similar to this. It's showing the most recent approximately one hour of Go 16 geocolor or visible imagery. So if you come over to the left um, where there's all this kind of white menu with the different tabs, if you go to the very bottom one that says labels layer, so you can click on the boundaries and that's just going to show the, um, the state and local um, and international boundaries. And then if you want the place names, you can add the labels layer and then that will add the place names. So you if you have either of these layers activated, when you save your, um, your static image file or an animation. So again, just to save a static image file, we come up to the, the little blue button that has the, the camera on it. Um, and then you can just draw a box around the area that you wanna save, and then you hit submit. This will be fast, because it's just one image. And then that opens in the new tab, and then you just right click, and then you save your image, or you could copy it as well. So you can see because I have those layers, the labels layers activated, the, um, the image that I'm saving actually has that geo-reference information on it. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, the next question is question eight. In Aerosol Watch, is the disk coverage only the one we are seeing or can we switch it to the whole globe? So as, um, as you, you saw when I did the demo, there's two basically two options. So there's the CONUS sector, which is what I was just showing. Um, and then there's the full disk sector, which is the whole hemispheric disk. Um, so because um, the, the GOES are satellites, they're geostationary satellites, they do not have global coverage. So there's no way to have, um, to switch anything to the whole globe on aerosol watch um, because they're, they're just showing the, um, the Western hemisphere, which is what the GOES are satellites cover. All right, uh, question nine, does NOAA geostationary data support HARP? So um, we didn't know what HARP is. Um, so Sal Water Powell, did we have any um, information about what HARP is? Did anybody add that to the chat? Or maybe uh, that's a follow up with I'm, in the q and I'm not later. sure, yeah, we, we can okay. address that later on. Okay, yeah, so if whoever asked this question wants to just um, sh like give us a little more information about what HARP is, then we can add that to the, the text here of the, the Q&A um, after the session's over. All right, so question 10, what are the limits in percent of the different data quality flags for AOD? 
Um, so this is a great question as well. So they don't they don't have limits in percent. Um, so they describe the confidence in the AOD data. It, it's it's not quite subjective, but it's more of a subjective sense in that they're they're divided into high, medium, and low. So you can see, and then not retrieved. So you can see the criteria that are used um, for assigning the quality flags. Um, they're given in what's called the algorithm theoretical basis document, the ATBD. Um, so table 3.9 um, has the, the, the criteria for the quality flags for AOD retrieved over water. And table 3.13 has the, the quality flags for the criteria for the retrieval of AOD over land. And so if you're you're more if you're interested in the quality flags, you kind of understand like what what's used to determine what the high, medium, and low AOD quality are, go look at those tables um, and it'll it'll explain everything for you. I think it'll make it more clear. Um, but I added the important, the, really the message for users is that you, the main thing to remember is that you want to make sure you use the recommended quality flags for your specific application. So if you're if you have a quantitative application, um, like for example, you're doing data assimilation uh, or verification with a model, then you want to use the high quality AOD only. Um, if you have a more qualitative application, like operational forecasting. Um, or any sort of situational awareness for um, for aerosol events like like uh, fires or smoke from fires or blowing dust, then you want to use what we call the top two qualities. That's the high and medium quality AOD data. Okay. Um, so question eleven. Um, so this person was confused about the um, AOD unsigned integer scaling from float that we showed I showed in the um, the Python demo. Um, so they're confused about um, the, they thought the standard range of AOD values is zero to one. Um, so, so they're kind of confused between the, 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 the available range of AOD, which as I mentioned, it, the, the, the full range of AOD that's going to be in a data file um, that's reported is going to be minus 0 0.05 to 5. Okay, but then typically when we display AOD, like if you're looking at aerosol watch, for example, or in the Python um, that, that I showed, um, typically when we display AOD, we display it from zero to one. Um, and that's the reason for that is we don't go all the way up to five. The reason for that is, is because typically most of the time AOD values are, are in, like in the actual atmosphere. They are rarely higher than one. So if we always show them from zero to five, then um, all of the, like for example, we're using a color bar. Uh, we used a rainbow color bar in the Python and aerosol watch uses a rainbow color bar. All of the, the AOD that would be shown would be squished down in those blue colors. So we wouldn't really be able to see any variation in the observed AOD. So if we went all the way up to five. So that's why we display it from zero to one. So we can see and observe and interpret the natural range in the, the AOD that we see in the atmosphere. Now, sometimes, of course, if we have really um, intense aerosol events, like we're in the middle of a wildfire, or maybe there's a Saharan dust transport event, then AOD can be higher than one. So in those cases, if you're making your own images, you might want to change the scale, and you might want to show AOD values higher than one, um, going up to five. But like I said, typically, when you see AOD displayed, um, it's usually shown ranging from zero to one, just so that we can actually see and interpret the full range of the AOD values. Okay, yeah, this is a great question. All right, um, question 12. Is there a way to download AOD time series for certain locations or points from the AWS database without downloading the retrospective set of GOES images? This would be useful for users who just need the values at certain locations. So as I'm reading this again, I'm wondering if I misinterpreted this question initially. So I just wanted to clarify, and if, if I did misinterpret this, I apologize, just, but just for everybody else too. So from AWS, you can't download the imagery. You can only download the, the data files themselves, um, which are in net CDF4 format, okay? So if you're looking for imagery, or you wanna download imagery, then you wanna go to the Aerosol Watch website, okay? Just wanted to make that clear at the top. So, um, so I think what this person is asking is basically can, Instead of downloading an entire data file, like for example in the Python, um, we wanted to look at um, the the the, a, the high AOD from smoke from fires that were burning in the Amazon in Central South America. So in order to to focus in on that subset of region, 
we need to download the AVI AOD data for the full disk sector, so for the whole hemispheric disk, so that because that includes the, the area over South America. So I think what this person is asking is, so instead of downloading that, that large data file, that's the whole full disk file, can instead we just download the subset of data that corresponds to, for example, the Central South America region? Um, and unfortunately, the answer to that is no, you can't. You have to download the entire data file, um, at least from the Aerosol Watch website. Um, I'm not aware of any, um, even NOAA has another um, data archive, which is called CLASS. Um, and even there, you, you, you can't unfortunately subset the files themselves and just download a subset of the data. So unfortunately, you, you do have to download the, the file for the whole sector. And again, either for, for aerosol optical depth, it's either gonna be full disk or the CONUS sector. So if you're, if you're in Central America or you're in South America, you're gonna have to download the, the, the data file that's for the full disk sector. And then once you have that downloaded, then you on your own can subset and pull out just the data for the location that you're interested in. Um, but you can certainly download a time series of data. You could, you could certainly download, let's say you wanted a week's worth of files um, at a certain, you know, at a certain uh, time or a period of time during the day. You could download those files from the Aerosol Watch website, but you have to, the copy is you have to download the entire uh, sector, either the full disk or the compass, whichever is appropriate for your location of interest. Yeah, that's a great question though. All right, question 13. Um, do you libraries such as X-Array and Python also automatically apply the scale factor in the add offset when, when um, reading in the, the AOD data variables? Um, yes, so I, I do use X-Array. I haven't used it in a while, so I couldn't remember, but one of our colleagues on the team actually um, uh, uh, pulled this up and checked. So it looks like that X-Array is, is um, built on the NetCDF4 package. It has that as a dependency. Um, so it makes sense that that, that would be the case. Um, but I, I believe I put a note in, you, you, know, can, you can always check this yourself if you're not sure. If you open up X-Array and you read in the AOD data uh, into a variable and then print out the array, and you, you'll see either their floating point numbers or their scaled integers. So you can always, and it always is a good idea when you're working with a new data set, just to check all the variables yourself and make sure you understand everything. Um, but X-ray should do the same, uh, kind of the same thing that we demonstrated today using the NetCDF4 package. Okay, that's a great question. Um, all right, question 14. Uh, for some reason, my files do not contain the AOD variable. Um, they do have the data quality flag information though. Any thoughts on how I can fix this? Yeah, so there, there, there were two thoughts that I had there. So first, you just wanna make sure that you actually downloaded the AOD data files. So if you, um, so whoever this person is, if you look at the file name, that really long file name that starts with uh, capital O-R underscore A-B-I, if you look at that file name and it doesn't include um, A-O-D-F, um, that means you didn't download the A-O-D data file. You got a different product by mistake. So if that's the case, go back um, to the, you know, where you download the files in block six, those pull down menus, and just make sure that you select it under product, the product menu, and you select it aerosol optical depth. Um, a common mistake is the first item in that list is aerosol detection product, which looks a little bit similar if you're not reading carefully to aerosol optical depth. So it's possible you got the aerosol detection product by mistake. Okay, so just double check that. All right, question 15, on aerosol watch, the available data seems to span UTC 1332 to 1447, six steps. Um, should the full daylight hours be available? I am looking at April 12, 2018. Yes, they should. So, so um, as I mentioned, when you, open, when you first open up aerosol watch website, it always displays the approximately most recent one hour's worth of data. So then even if you change dates, um, by default, that's, that's still that one hour, approximately one hour time period will still be selected. So what you wanna do is you wanna go, actually, I can demonstrate this. Can I, can I share my screen again? So hopefully you guys can see this. So again, um, we're on our Aerosol Watch website. Um, so if you, um, you come up to the top here, again, these blue buttons, you're gonna pick the one that has a little clock on it. It's, and if you hover over it, it'll say select animation range. You select that one and this window will pop up and it will allow you to select the animation range that you're interested in. So again, you can select the start time and then the end time. 
Um, so again, I'm looking at today's data. So, but let's say I just wanted to look at from 1300 to 1400 UTC. Oops. Oh, 1351. Um, and then I would hit submit. Um, before I do that, though, I just want to remember, especially for this person that's looking at um, a retrospective case, so something in the past, um, don't select like the whole day, like 12 hours or 24 hours worth of data um, to animate because it'll be really slow. Um, I recommend starting with maybe two hours, maybe stretch that to three or four, depending on how fast your internet connection is. Um, you know, try and see, but start with two hours worth of data or maybe even one hour's worth, like I'm gonna show, and we'll hit submit, and it will bring up those, those uh, that time period. Um, if you if things are loading really slowly, um, especially if you start animating it, um, then select a shorter time period. Okay. All right, great. Next question is. Um, all right, looks like 16 and 17 we just got brand new. Um, so let's um, we haven't had time to, to fill those in. So um, let's actually skip those and we can fill those in after the fact. Um, so let's go to question 18. Um, in the beginning of the webinar, um, some slides was given the range of the AOD values from minus 0 0.5 to 5, but we know that AOD is thickness, so how can it be negative? Yes, that's a great question. So I mentioned that in the slides. So the um, obviously AOD can't be negative, right? So those negative numbers, they the, the minus 0 0.05 to 1 don't really have any physical value. So what you should do is you should think of those as very small positive AODs. Um, so what those, those that negative range, that small negative range, it represents the uncertainty in the AOD retrieval, okay? So that's why um, there is that the, the option, the possibility of having those very, that very small range of negative numbers, they represent the uncertainty in the, um, the AOD retrieval from the algorithm. But physically, think of them as very small positive AOD values. Okay, that's a great question. Uh, question 19. Oh, this is another one we had a chance, haven't had a chance to answer yet. Is there any work being done to develop better imagery or products of the areas that are currently difficult to map, such as the Caribbean due to sun glint and coastal, coastal areas? Um, so sun glint um, is not a, a permanent feature, so it's gonna vary during the course of the day. So um, in the Caribbean, for example, um, you can uh, you can get very uh, you know quite a number of hours of AOD retrievals um, just depending on the time of day. Some of it, of course, will be covered by some glint, but certainly not the entire day. Um, so often um, I have a, a, a Twitter feed called at Aerosol Watch, um, and I often will post um, uh, ABI Go 16 ABI AOD imagery of the Caribbean because of the Saharan dust uh, events that periodically impact the Caribbean. So certainly um, sun glint shouldn't be an insurmountable issue. Um, so along coastal areas, that is an area of active research. Um, so I, I have some, some papers, that, some references that I can put in to, um, to the answer to this question um, after the, the Q&A is over. Yeah, there, there is definitely work that's being done uh, looking at coastal areas. And I don't know, unless, unless um, Powen has something that he wants to add to there, there about that. Uh, no, I think that is, sounds good. Okay. All right, so it's about, it's 12.05 now. Um, so I think probably when we, we want to start wrapping up. Um, Helen, Helen, you... Sure, yeah, yeah. I think we kind of addressed most of the questions, so that is good. So I think we can wrap it up now. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you every, everyone for attending this part two and thanks to Dr. Amy Hub for really nice presentation and uh, taking time to answer all the questions. And we'll share this question answer transcripts once we proofread uh, internally in few days on our website.